It is my totally idiotic belief that most people are born with the basic tools to become rock stars. Britney Spears, for instance, has an inoffensive voice and the ability to suspend large reptiles from her boobs. The making or rendering of popular songs is more a matter of determination than aptitude. The central allure of American Idol, a show I have not actually seen, thank you, resides in the powerful fantasy that a divine voice lurks within all of us, ready to obliterate all our liabilities and doubts and transform us into the rock stars we know ourselves to be. The reason we are not all rock stars is because most of us are unprepared to do the sort of sustained and lonely work that would allow us to learn an instrument, let alone, <laughs> yes, the broader language of music, let alone how to suspend a large reptile from our boobs. That is harder than it looks. And then further unprepared to compose our own songs and to perform them in front of other people and to do so with enough gusto that we might compel someone, many someones actually, to pay for a recording of our songs. It's a lot of labor when you break it down, a lot of potential humiliation. So this book, though it will feature plenty of rock stars and include many opinions related to rock stars, is centrally about what it's like to be a drooling fanatic, which is disappointing, I know. But most of human history, the vast underside, is about people not getting to do what they truly want to do. Prehistoric man, for instance, wanted to eat and fuck and sleep in peace, and he almost never got to do that. <laughs> the inhabitants of the early republics dreamed of liberty, but most spent their lives in the yoke. Those of us with the dumb luck to be born in what we call the modern, developed world can pretty much eat and fuck to our heart's content. We've got hours for dreaming, too though a lot of that work has been outsourced to Hollywood. Consumption gets to be the real star these days because consumption pays the bills. But here's a little secret between you, me, and the rest of the mall. Buying shit isn't enough. What we wish for in our secret hearts is self-expression, the chance to reveal ourselves and to be loved for this revelation devoured by love. And thus most of us go about our duties of commerce and leisure in a state of perpetual longing with nocturnal excursions into the province of despair. I know, it gets even funnier. <laughs> it's like, this is supposed to be rock and roll, man. <laughs> this book is for those of us who have converted such unrequited desires into noble obsessions. It happens to be about music as opposed to ice cream or Picasso or the Boston Red Sox because music came before anything else, before language and large-scale war and liquid soap, and because music is the one giant thing America has done right amid all it has done wrong. I agree. Music, that ancient and incorruptible blessing. I guess you're not really gonna sing along. You're gonna be one of those fucking crowds. All right. I know none of you know the words. It's an obscure song. All right, you've been warned. It's important that they think you're a dipshit because you're much more likely to worship them in this case and to adopt their musical taste, which is better than yours, as a kind of gospel. <laughs> we need look no further than 1978, the year Styx was named America's favorite band by one of, <laughs> yes, you were there too, by one of the many gold-plated award shows that slithered to prominence in the 70s. I remember this vividly because I raced to my older brother Dave's room with the news. He was the one who had turned me on to the mind-blowing brilliance of Styx and who I expected would share in my, personal, my sense of personal vindication. Styx just won best band, I yelled. Styx sucks, he said <laughs> quietly. Get out. I was dumbfounded. Sticks sucks, but sticks so much didn't suck. Sticks ruled. Sticks were geniuses. They were like Mozart, like five Mozarts, each with diaphanous hair and shiny space age jumpsuits, and they wrote pulsating anthems about renegade men and blue-collar men and epic ballads about love and loss and excessive cocaine use. 
none of which mattered because inexplicably, Dave said they sucked. A few days later, I stole into his room and unearthed the culprit, an album called Outlandos de Moor by the police. What a disturbing artifact. Rock bands, after all, had mystical names like Led Zeppelin and Blue Oyster Cult, but the police? I was a 12-year-old whose hobbies were shoplifting and pyromania. <laughs> Why would I listen to a band called The Police? <laughs> Nor did the songs make sense. They were jerky and tense with minor key melodies and jangled bursts of guitar. No solos. Dude, no solos? <laughs> like, what in the fuck universe? And the lyrics weren't about the reaper or invisible airways crackling with light. They were about loneliness and rejection, subjects on which I needed no additional briefing. Thank you very much. I listened to Outlandos de Moore straight through, trembling with disgust. Why then did I keep sneaking into Dave's room and listening to the thing? If this were the sort of book written by a professional music critic, I'd now be compelled to identify Outlandos as a watershed album marking a shift from the bombastic escapism of prog rock to the edgy emotionalism of new wave. That's how they all talk. I'd note the deft deployment of punk and reggae elements in a pop context and blah, 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 blah. But I'm a drooling fanatic. All I know is how I felt listening to the music, anxious and excited and weirdly relieved. There was this one song, that was basically a long rant against an ex-girlfriend. But you don't care, so I won't cry. And you'll be sorry when I'm dead. We'll be on your head. I know, we could go all night. <laughs> when my dad heard these lines, he laughed. This was a funny song about being jilted, then committing suicide. Suicide could be funny. Equally shocking, rock music could be funny. This is the big thing about having an older sibling. They're always pushing the budding fanatic to venture beyond the safe margins of his or her taste without meaning to, because honestly, dude, they just want you out of their fucking room. <laughs> they implant the vital notion that there is music out there that you don't know about yet and that you'd better get hip to unless you want to remain an immature twerp who worships sticks but you can never catch up. That's the thing. Because your interest in a band is, to the older sibling, the essential indicator that that band is over. <laughs> You're the Casey Kasem of their existence. <laughs> I chased Dave from the police all the way out to the margins of punk, and he did finally manage to shake me off his trail, but he had to go over to the dark side to do it. He became a deadhead. Yeah, I need a miracle! <laughs> I didn't just like music, I needed music. There wasn't much else on my dance card. Pinball, TV, masturbation, eventually. Like none of you have ever <laughs> masturbated. I thank you. I spent a lot of time alone on the carpet in the living room, listening to Abbey Road or Mind Games or Through the Past Darkly, and studying these records, poring over the lyrics and album art. The back cover of Goat's Head Soup, with the actual goat's head in a cauldron of soup. I puzzled over that image for the entirety of 1975. Could one actually make soup out of a goat's head? What would it taste like? What would happen to the horns and the fur and the teeth and the eyes? Did one eat the eyes or were they there just for flavor? <laughs> Music was also a way of reaching out to friends, other boys mostly. It is in the nature of pre- and adolescent males to, uh, to isolate and brood, to interact as indirectly as possible with aggressive ritual as mediation. These days it's done with video games about carjacking. But back then, it was a devotion to particular albums. Scott Sucher and I spent most of seventh grade locked in his room listening to Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap, yeah! There was a protocol. He lay on the bed. I sat with my back against the box springs. We slammed Hostess products forage from the pantry. There was almost no talking. A few words to fill the scratchy silence between songs. You poot, you did. Dick wad. <laughs> poot wad. 
Then it was back to the joyous malevolence of ACDC, its perverted and fuzzy roar, the gravelly alliteration of the title track, all those croak Ds to which we chanted along so softly, and the leering innuendo of big balls in which Bon Scott observes. Now you know the words to this. Scott delivered these lines with a smirking pomposity that struck us as unbearably sophisticated. The man was Byron. In the medias passages of particular songs, we closed our eyes and let the chords surge through us. It was a kind of trance. We were alone, but not alone. We were embarrassed. Everything embarrassed us in seventh grade, but flushed with angry hopes. When people bitch about the death of the vinyl LP as a medium, and Lord knows they bitch. What they're mostly lamenting is the death of this kind of listening, music as a concerted sonic experience rather than the backing track to a flashing screen. What I'm suggesting here is that drooling fanaticism boils down to undivided attention, which is not only our most endangered human resource, but the first and final act of love. At the tender age of 19, I became a music critic. I was dispatched to review a Bob Dylan show despite having no training as a musician and not actually knowing who Bob Dylan was. <laughs> Please stop laughing. Had I been quizzed on the meaning of the word glissando, I would have answered with some confidence, I'm afraid, a type of fancy ice cream. <laughs> not to be confused with vibrato, which was a gynecological instrument. And yet, as far as my readers were concerned, I was a professional critic. If this sounds absurd, consider the proposition that greeted me when I arrived at the El Paso Times two years later, fresh from college. Would I like to be the paper's full-time music critic? Well, of course I would. <laughs> so I was a lazy and frankly suck-ass reviewer in El Paso, but I was also, in my own frankly suck-ass way, up against an ontological dilemma. How does one describe music using words? Talented critics can, of course, describe music with sonic precision. The real problem is emotional. The prose, for all its technical fidelity, conveys almost nothing about what music feels like. Consider the famous chord progression that Angus Young plays at the beginning of Back in Black. A good writer could tell us about those grinding seismic chords, the distinct rhythm of their deployment, even that sly, arpeggiated little five-note lick that acts as a segue from one volley to the next. But those are just pale approximations of what it feels like to hear that intro, the squirt of sinister glee that makes most people, even decent religious folks, reach for their air guitar. Now consider the rest of the song, the rhythmic structures, Brian Johnson's howling vocal, harmonic and tonal relationships. But okay, let's say you've taken your rock critic steroids and you're able to describe all these elements. How then do you convey the simultaneity of all that noise, the blissful riot of sound we experience as a singular thing, the song? But okay, okay, let's say you've taken your rock critic steroids for years. You're the Barry Bonds of rock criticism. And so you managed to get this too. You'd still be left with the basic and insoluble crisis of melody. Words cannot be made into notes. And even if you somehow magically solved that crisis, which you couldn't, you'd still be missing what it feels like for a particular fan to hear a particular song, let alone songs, let alone in concert, because this involves a collaboration between the music and the fan's own needs, his or her own lust for joy, sorrow, power, rage, sex, and oh, what the hell, hope. The closest I came to grappling with the rock critic paradox was at an MC Hammer concert. I think we all saw this coming. 
I stood beneath the stage watching Hammer twitch in his weird Sinbad pants while a battalion of dancers in identical Sinbad pants replicated his every twitch. Hammer barked lyrics about jewelry and torture. The melodies sampled from bubblegum hits affixed themselves to the artillery of drum machines. Lights popped and scrolled. Sparks vomited from some invisible portal. It was like watching an ad for a delicious soda that makes people want to commit murder. But then I looked at the people around me there in the fifth row of the Pan Am Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico. You can't touch this. They were all dancing wildly, hooting at the sweaty boobed fly girls and barking along with Hammer and without even realizing it, mimicking little hammerish flourishes, the frenetic Egyptian jazz hands and the mincing buckle step. We talked about it every rehearsal and he just won't stop doing it. He just, he just feels it. These, these people were plugged into a powerful communal experience. They didn't look upon MC Hammer as a musical huckster, but an entertainer of the first rank and maybe even in a sense a prophet of self-assertion. Proof that any man endowed with sufficient determination, no matter how meagerly endowed with talent, might gain trespass into the kingdom of fame. Yes, I was stoned. But my larger point is that there's no angle in hating on a particular song or band or genre. Our species is adaptable. That's our evolutionary trump card. If the human ear is given a chance, not cowed into snobbery, it can find rewards in almost any form of music. I think here of a line by Robert Christgau, who for many years represented the gold standard of rock critic snark. Assessing the work of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's brain salad surgery, he wrote, quote, the sound is so crystalline, you can hear the jism as it drips off the microphone. <laughs> Yummy. The line is funny, an appropriate epitaph for a trio that was spinal tappish in its pretense. But when I think about that album, what I remember is sitting around with my pal Dale McCourt, listening to the endless onanistic glissandos and howled couplets of Carnival Nine. I assume we'll all get to the end here and we can stop listening to this awesome song. So, rock and roll. Uh, as, a, uh, as a broad working definition, art awakens feeling. Every form has its merits and demerits. Paintings, for instance, work fast and require no moving parts, yet are hard to steal. Films are easy to watch and enveloping, but they carry the risk that you will see Philip Seymour Hoffman naked. <laughs> the only thing wrong with music, as far as I'm concerned, is that you cannot eat it. From a purely emotional standpoint, it remains far more potent than any other artistic medium. And I remember the exact moment this dawned on me. I was watching Late Night with David Letterman. Willie Nelson was the guest. This was the watered-down Willie of the 80s, the stoner cowpoke in dusty pigtails, and Dave was giving him a hard time. Why don't you sing something for us, Dave said, almost tauntingly. Willie sat there for a few seconds, and then he opened his mouth and began to sing, and the sound of his voice, that glorious battered baritone, sucked every bit of irony out of that room. I had no idea that Willie Nelson was such an unbelievably beautiful fucking artist. Mm. It's a joyous thing to discover that kind of ignorance. This is what songs do. They remind us that our motion, emotions are not an inconvenient and vaguely embarrassing aspect of the human enterprise, but its central purpose. They make us feel specific things we might never have felt otherwise. 
every time I listen to Sunday Bloody Sunday, for instance, I feel a pugnacious righteousness about the fate of the Irish people. I hear that thwacking military drum beat and Bono starts wailing about the news he heard today. I'm basically ready to enlist in the IRA and stomp some British imperialist ass. Hell yes, bring on the fucking bangers and mash. Let's get this McJihad started. I feel these things despite the fact that A, I am not Irish. I am Jewish, which has only in common with the Irish-ish. B, the song actually advocates pacifism, somewhat disappointingly, I must say. That's always a disappointment. And C, I really actually hate you too. That's just me. The same thing happens with Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. I don't exactly get psyched to join the Klan, but I do get this powerful desire to drink beer and drive a pickup truck and maybe shoot off some guns and most of all, not to be looked down upon by some fucking overeducated nigger loving Yankee such as myself. <laughs> Intellectually, I recognize that the song is shallow and racist and that it advances the notion that former Alabama governor and avowed segregationist George Wallace is an American hero. I also get that if all the members of Leonard Skinner were still alive, one or more of them would be members of the Republican congressional leadership team. I get that, but I can't help it. Sweet Home Alabama makes me feel a deep yearning for my home and my kin and the swampers down in Muscle Shoals who pick me up when I'm feeling blue, even though these same swampers would very possibly kick my Jew ass sideways if I ever sidled into one of their taverns and ordered me a Chablis. Howdy, boys. Are you the swampers? <laughs> Songs take us deeper into ourselves by taking us away from ourselves. They expand our empathic imaginations. When we listen to Jack and Diane, we all become teenagers <laughs> sucking on chili dogs and reveling in the, ch I guess, yes, yeah, sucking on them, I guess. Especially Diane, but also possibly Jack, or maybe together. Uh, and reveling in the fleeting ecstasies of green love. And when we listen to I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor, we all become empowered sisters showing our abusive exes the door. No, you didn't. <laughs> and when we listen to Rocket Man, we all become astronauts blasted away from our loved ones into orbits of lonely obligation. And God knows we're all homesick travelers when we hear Homeward Bound. Even when we're at home, I, I can be sitting at home with a fire going and my family around me and I'm still fucking homesick when that song comes. I, like, I gotta get home. I've cherry picked songs that most people know, but like any other fanatic, I've got an endless list of obscure songs that induce the same kind of weirdly gratifying identity crisis. When I was drinking by the band Hem makes me want to be an alcoholic. It makes me want to be an alcoholic involved with another alcoholic. It makes me pine for the perverse safety of all the self-defeating relationships I've ever been in. That's how beautiful that song is. I've always been drawn to songs that make me feel bad and that make feeling bad feel good. <laughs> These songs, depression songs, allow us to slough the small emotions that compose our defense mechanisms for the large emotions that make us feel genuinely alive. They convert self-pity into sorrow, anxiety into fear, grievance into grief. To clarify, depression songs don't make people depressed. They articulate a pre-existing depression, and when they're really cooking, they ennoble that depression. <laughs> yes, they do. Nearly all the songs I return to, the ones that have come to represent entire eras of my life, are depression songs. And everybody has his or her own set list because the main ingredient in the construction of a depression song is you, the depressed listener. If you play the song, Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor, for instance, 
my wife is instantly transported back to 1990, managing the cosmetics section at CVS. How many people have wept to this song? Hands, please. Thank you. She's a shy 15-year-old mooning over one in a series of mulleted cads to whom she's pledged her undying love. It's all there, the knot in her throat, the heavy bands of blue eyeshadow, the mocking promises on the glass bottles of nail polish it was her job to shell. My time equivalent depression song, and I confess this with little pride, is Never Tear Us Apart by In Excess, which you might remember as the one with the video where the comely lead singer Michael Hutchins wanders morosely around Prague and then right at the end accidentally hangs himself while masturbating. Do you remember that? What you know is true Don't have to tell you I love Precious high. It's an addictive soul song built around synths, a quartet of plucked guitar notes, and various dramatic pauses. The vocals are overwrought in the best way. Hutchins tells his lover that they could live for a thousand years, but if I hurt you, I make wine from your tears. And rather than questioning how that would work, <laughs> or how such a wine might taste, or what exactly it would mean that you want to use the tears of your lover to make an alcoholic beverage, my intuitive reaction is to think, that is just heavy. <laughs> this was certainly what I was thinking as I staggered across the soggy lawns of my college campus, having just enjoyed a one-night stand that I assumed would last for a thousand years and produce oceans of Chardonnay. My enamorata had a slightly different take. She cringed when she saw me the next day. We were not going to last a thousand years. We had barely lasted a thousand seconds. I know you love it, man, but you got to turn it down. I know. It's tough. You can listen to it at home. <laughs> All right. So this is, uh, this is uh, wh number 141. Smoking more pot than Bob Marley and possibly the Whalers before entering Graceland. Boom. Why did I do this? Because I was secretly dreading Graceland, the preening necrophilia of the scene, that tawdry American knack for spiritual projection, for wor worshiping the wrong savior for the wrong reason in the wrong way. I figured getting stoned might make the experience seem more profound and therefore less depressing. It's the same doomed theory I continually apply to Hollywood films. And I needed Graceland to be profound at least a little because I had driven 700 miles to be there as a favor to my lovesick friend Tina, who was, unbeknownst to me, a devout Elvis person. It was a bit like discovering someone is born again. You have to respect the purity, but you don't really want to hear the rap. <laughs> so I smoked bowl after bowl until I could no longer locate my mouth, <laughs> which was, I was for a while smoking out of my ear. We boarded a bus full of more devout Elvis people, southern grandmas with big purses and sullen Midwestern goth kids and packs of camera Japanese. As we entered the estate, they fell into a collective and dreadful hush. A female staffer, blonde, hot kinked, erotically nervous, met us in the foyer with our audio kits. I kept forgetting I was wearing headphones and, uh, because I was so incredibly stoned and yelling at Tina, hey! You know what the jungle room looks like? It's like Africa if they sold Africa on the Home Shopping Network. Why are the walls covered in twine? Hey, did Elvis's parents really sleep in these beds? Couldn't he have gotten them bigger beds? That's fucked up. <laughs> this was Graceland in a nutshell. It was supposed to be about the grandeur of the king, but it kept being about his humiliation. Elvis sprawls on the white couchette in his media room with a plate of bacon watching three TVs at once. Then he tries to beat back the fat with Benny's and he can't sleep at night, so he sits up composing his list of enemies. Then he shoots at his radar range. Then he visits Nixon. Then he does karate and pulls something. 
then he can't get out of bed and they cancel the tour, then he falls off his toilet and dies. It is sad. Devout Elvis people were everywhere, snapping photos of gold ref records. The reverence was suffocating. I retreated to the top of a carpeted staircase and found myself staring into a darkened room. Where was I? Where was Tina? Why was there a rope across the doorway with a sign reading, No Trespassing? Wasn't trespassing more or less the business model at Graceland? <laughs> a voice beckoned me from the bottom of the stairs. Sir, a young man stood frowning at me. The name tag on his oversized blazer read, Kevin. Where am I? I said. Those are private quarters, sir. People still live here? <laughs> Kevin said, you need to come downstairs, sir, right now. Kevin was right. I needed to come downstairs. I needed to flee Graceland and take a hot shower. But the pot wouldn't let me. <laughs> it kept telling me that I should leap over the rope and breach the private quarters and find the bathroom where Elvis breathed his last and drop a symbolic deuce. <laughs> bad pot, bad. <laughs> Are we gonna have a problem, Kevin said. He touched at the tender spray of acne on his right cheek. I found Tina outside, and we proceeded from the shooting range to the nearby meditation garden. <laughs> I want to read that sentence one more time because <laughs> I think if you, if you boiled America for like a millennium, this is what you would come up with. I found Tina outside, and we proceeded from the shooting range to the very nearby and possibly adjacent meditation garden. Elvis was actually buried in the meditation garden, which I did not understand at all. Did Elvis consider death a form of extreme meditation? I wanted to ask Tina, but she was weeping. Nearly everyone around me was weeping. They were weeping and taking photos of each other, and I knew that in a few weeks, when they got their photos from Graceland back, they'd gaze at these images of themselves weeping in front of Elvis's grave and start weeping again. And this thought made me sad for America, the great disconnect between our personal causes for grief and our actual tears. And though I was not sad enough to start weeping myself, I did flee to the gift shop where, in a final spasm of defiance, I shoplifted an official Elvis wristwatch. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's Dan Byrne. Go find all his music. Ah, uh, okay. A certain Elise Blank invited me to visit her upstate. We'd met two months earlier at a literary event and instantly sensed in the other the avid temperament of the orgasmically needy. A series of quivering phone calls ensued. Elise had the dewy gaze of a Bollywood heroine and the relentless pep of a Midwestern football mascot. I wanted to defile her. This was during my era of dismal blind dates and I saw no reason to behave responsibly I was still living in Somerville and scraping by as an adjunct professor of bitterness. So I flew out to a writer's conference near the college where she taught and crashed at her place. For two days we knocked around town gobbling fried fish and trying to figure out how to jumpstart the defiling process. At night we lay in our respective rooms broiling and cowardice. The tension was idiotic and throbbing and awesome. On morning three, I woke up determined to act. I took a shower and slathered on deodorant, and when I walked out of her bathroom, the stereo was blaring. The only way I can describe the music is to say that it was mall friendly, soft, synthesized, entirely devout in its stunted emotional ambitions. Who is this? I said. Air supply, Elise said. I searched her tender face for the slightest trace of irony. This is their greatest hit, she said. You're such chicken shits. All right. I'm drunker than you. That's fine. I closed my eyes and nodded. It seemed important that I not say anything snide. My mind lunged about for possible air supply repartee. 
The only thing that came to mind was a high school soccer practice where John Carnoy mentioned air supply and Davey Anderson and Donnie Lovato started chanting fag supply in what they took to be Australian accents. And how were air supply doing after all these years? Why, they were all out of love. If you are now thinking I rebuffed Elise because of her fondness for air supply, think again, friend. After 72 hours spent marinating in lust, you could not have stopped my dick with a taser. <laughs> could try. The problem arose, as it so often does, upon reflection. Elise was supposed to be everything I wanted, brilliant, delectable, willing. But as I returned to Boston, as I furiously throttled myself to the memory of her haunches, my mind kept fixing on air supply. I kept seeing Russell Hitchcock in his lacquered mullet fro. Worse, I kept hearing his voice. Did I honestly believe Elise lacked the emotional depth required to be involved with me? Was this even possible? Indeed, wasn't my willingness to dismiss this woman based solely on her earnest devotion to a soft rock duo proof of my own spiritual disfigurement? In a word, possibly. In fact, my reaction neatly encapsulates the romantic inclinations of the drooling fanatic. I could see based on the air supply situation that Elise and I were susceptible to different myths. Hers were starry-eyed and operatic, full of blonde people and members-only jackets necking on tarmacs. Mine were shadowy and downbeat and involved horny communists engaged in light bondage. <laughs> there was some chance our myths might overlap in the arena of depravity. Perhaps the communists were blonde, for instance. Perhaps the bondage could be staged on a tarmac. But soon enough, Elise would be sighing a lot and asking why I listened to such sad music all the time. Did I have something against just being happy? And I'd be gouging up her air supply records, then blaming it on her dog. Ah, yes. Okay. It is fair to ask at this point how I ever managed to get married. <laughs> it is certainly a question my family has pondered. A proper librettist, or perhaps air supply, would have drawn it up perfectly. My wife, Erin, and I locking eyes across a windswept piazza, plenty of loud obstacles in the wings. Alas, the truth is a bit lumpier. In fact, a mere two weeks after meeting Aaron, I announced that we had to stop seeing each other. My superego had decided I needed to find a wife, and while my superego had not bothered to inform my slobbering id, it had made a pretty convincing case against Aaron, who for all her charms was 27 and just a few years out of college. So I bid her farewell, convinced I'd behaved with noble restraint and returned to my alleged quest for a bride. I drove an hour through the snow to meet one woman. We'd made sexy talk on the phone and swapped photos. It was going to be tremendous. It was always going to be tremendous. Then she opened the door, and her face was that of an ostrich, pinched and belligerent, and mine was that of a weasel, beady and mean, and our hearts staggered through the rest of it. The hope punched out of us. I'm glad you enjoyed that, because <laughs> I sure didn't. On such nights, a little later than was appropriate, I would dial Aaron's number. I've got something you need to hear, I'd say, which was deplorable, but at least true. Because when I wasn't off turning dates into Bergman films, all I did was hunt for new dope. And so Aaron appeared, and we retreated into my cave and did what was required, all the sweaty investigations. Though best of all was lying in the dark afterward and listening to the songs that were unbeknownst to either of us, I think slowly twining our fates. We ate French toast in great abundance and slept as if dead. After a few weeks, I'd break up with her, though sometimes she broke up with me, coming to her senses with a soft reluctance while I nodded soberly. 
But then the new Chuck Ro Prophet record came out, No Other Love, it was called, and I knew Aaron would want to hear it. I know we're broken up, I said, but you're not going to believe this record. This was the summer of 2003, as I recall, and we spent the next week doing nothing but listening in bed until we knew all the words and the tempos had been absorbed by our muscles and every song seemed to be trying to tell us something new about our dire arrangement. It was the perfect record for us, gorgeous and doomed, like a kiss that tastes of blood. And the song we took as our anthem was Summertime Thing, which we sang to each other and to ourselves, dancing across the dirty floors of my apartment naked and bracing ourselves against the relevant countertops. Erin knew she shouldn't have allowed to herself to get sucked back into my orbit, and I couldn't tell her otherwise. This is how it goes when a drooling fanatic is falling in love, especially when he doesn't know or won't admit he's falling in love. It's not the lightning bolt or the sunset embrace. It's the way she infiltrates your most sacred LPs, quietly erases the why from your collection. I continued to go on dates. That winter I took out a doctor, smart, attractive, Jewish even. We got back to her apartment and I began rooting around for her record collection. Where's your music? I said casually. Oh, she said, my schedule's pretty hectic. Right, but right now, I said, we could listen to something right now. She smiled a little indulgently as if to say, I don't know how it is with you writers, but this is how it is with us doctors. <laughs> Though what she said was maybe worse. I think I've got a Charday disc in my car. And so I found myself at home again in the familiar rooms, and though I knew it was a mistake, I put on one of Aaron's favorites, Postcards from Downtown by Dana Kurtz, a collection of songs so full of romantic woe, it might as well have come with a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and I was doing okay, really, until the moment, four and a half minutes into her rueful epic, Patterson, when the song seems to be drawing to an end, and instead, the time signature slows and we hear the trill of an accordion and violins and Dana begins singing in Italian of all things. Get all of her music immediately. And listening to this voice echo about my bedroom, its unending dejection made me realize that keeping Aaron at bay was no longer an option, that my loneliness was not some precious artistic prerogative or exalted state, but simply an ongoing regret. I needed her in close where we could, li where we could hear the music together. Erin and I were lying in bed, stoned, when she started in again about her single days, which is a special code phrase she uses when she wants to remind me about the time Kip Winger nearly propositioned her. This took place during Erin's first year in grad school. She'd been invited by an old friend to a VH1-sponsored event, which combined the channel's parasitic passion for aging celebrities with its ongoing campaign to resuscitate the music of the 80s. It is, okay. It is, uh, that's a brave stance, sir. <laughs> it is fair to suppose Aaron was lonely. It is fair to suppose she had had a few drinks and that these drinks helped steer her into the seat next to Kip Winger at the table where the musicians were signing merchandise for fans. Many of these fans were, and I quote Aaron, slutty girls with their tits hanging out, <laughs> whose sexual availability was understood, but to hear Aaron tell it, Kip Winger hadn't been interested in them. To hear Aaron tell it, Kip had been interested in Aaron. It pleased Aaron a great deal to be the object of Kip Winger's lewd banter, and it pleased her to be able to report to me the next day on the phone that she had been the object of Kip Winger's lewd banter and that he had discussed oral sex and implied his expertise and stopped just short of inviting her back to his hotel room. Or maybe he had invited her. It was impossible to know what happened, and she enjoyed this ambiguity also. <laughs> uh. No, no, 
turn it down, please. So this was her Kip Winger story, and she was telling it to me once again. Now that we were old married farts with a kid sacked out across the hall, the pot had made her nostalgic. Then she started in with certain facts about Kip mentioned in previous tellings, such as the fact that Kip had studied ballet and could kick his foot over his head while wearing leather trousers. <laughs> and Kip had studied classical music and composition. And Kip was not a tall man, but he had aged superbly. Then she got online and showed me a YouTube video of Kip playing classical guitar in leather trousers. <laughs> this was technically our date night. Now another sort of couple, a couple who composed of at least one person who isn't a drooling fanatic, would have probably dropped Kip Winger as a thematic element at this point and proceeded to the evening's intended highlight, essentially comic sexual toil. But my wife's reverie demanded a response. I reminded her that I was the one in the marriage who had spoken to Kip way back in 1989 <laughs> when he was at the height of his powers, grand jetting his way through 17 and scheduling his groupies in 15 minute intervals. And my wife had probably forgotten and I was now going to remind her I had been a professional music critic once who possessed Kip Winger's personal phone number and who, what's more, had covered the Grammys. Once this was on the table, it hardly seemed fair not to provide a full account. My wife was lightly snoring now. <laughs> I should add that Kip Winger continues to be a source of marital tension because my wife recently informed me in a manner simultaneously abashed and ragingly proud that she was actually the cause of Kip Winger getting an erection during their VH1-sponsored tete-a-tete meaning that they had had the equivalent of, I guess you could say, terrestrial close-range phone sex, is what I'm getting at. Though she didn't want this vital elaboration printed in my book, lest it adversely affect her future chances with Kip. <laughs> and when pressed on this topic, suggested that Kip might one day in our future, our possible near future, wait, let me try to remember how she put this. Oh yes, here it is come pirouetting into our bedroom in his leather pants. <laughs> and was therefore, at this point in our story, suggesting that she wanted Kip Winger in our sexual lives as a third in our threesome. And what's more, with that established, she went on to mention, with the sort of casualness that drives us doubt-choked Jews crazy, that Kip's wife was supposedly smoking hot and a swinger to boot. Which, it seemed to me, as a doubt-choked Jew, was the moment when she was actually envisioning a threesome consisting of A, Kip Winger, B, his smoking hot swinger wife, and C, not me. <laughs> this conversation took place on the eve of this book's publication and therefore robbed me of the honor of titling this interlude, How My Wife Gave Kip Winger a Boner, or perhaps more poetically, Kip Winger's Boner. Well, 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 let's all have a cigarette. <laughs> a few years ago, my pal Tom Finkel called me up. You know what's great, he asked, listening to Bob Dylan with your baby daughter. I'd never heard Tom speak with such contentment. I could hear Dylan in the background, and I imagined Tom lying on the couch, the kid curled on his chest. I thought about that phone call a lot recently. It connotes a certain fantasy that drooling fanaticism and parenthood are not only reconcilable, but ideal dance partners. Who better to indoctrinate into the pleasures of song than your children? It hasn't worked out quite that way in our household, though. Our three-year-old Josie does love music, but she does not now, nor has she ever wanted anything to do with my music. She's got her own music, and woe unto thee who fucks with her playlist. <laughs> My wife learned this a few months ago when she walked into the child's room. I want Dino 5, Josie shrieked. The Dino 5 is a dinosaur-themed children's hip-hop album. Here comes, here comes the Dino 5. 
It is exactly as charming as this description implies. Oh, honey, my wife said, not the Dino Five again. Josie's face, her entire being crumpled. She wasn't upset that I was saying no to her, Aaron told me later. It was that I'd insulted her music. It was like I'd just done the worst, most hurtful thing in the world. Oh, God, Aaron was close to tears herself. <laughs> Cry, they love it, honey. All this has reinforced my belief that drooling fanaticism is an innate tendency, something that gets bred out of us as we get older, like playing with our food. It is certainly true that when I find a song I love, my natural impulse is to play it 12 times in a row. The reason I don't is because I've learned that pop songs have limited durability. They can only surprise us so many times. Once we memorize all the moves, the fills, the solos, the vocal turns, we stop listening in the same way. The song no longer transports us. It's certainly possible to recapture that spark, but it's never the same as the first time in love, in music, in anything. And so over the years, drooling fanatics learn to conserve gratification. So Josie and her little brother will learn to conserve gratification. They'll probably dream of being rock stars too. Why not? They'll grow up with two parents who dreamed of being rock stars in a house filled with instruments those parents can no longer play. And probably, this must be said, they won't be rock stars. How many of us get to be? But what they will have, what we all get, is the chance to be drooling fanatics. And I hope that they feel, as I do, a bursting gratitude for those musicians brave enough to speak the first and final language of our hearts. If they're lucky, someday they'll have children of their own, and they'll realize that you don't have to be a rock star to feel like a rock star. All you need is a soft little human with a sweet-smelling head who settles down at night with her bottle and says, Papa, sing. What song do you want, I say? And Josie says corn, which means Jimmy Crack corn. Or, <laughs> or ring, which means hush little baby. Or most often mountain, which means she'll be coming around the mountain. Then she says it again. Papa, sing. And I get to say, sheesh, I thought you'd never ask. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>